we might kick off. I think there's still some people joining. Um, <clears throat> but, uh, okay, yeah, I think we're just going to jump in. All right, so good morning to everybody online. The voice you're hearing now is uh, Jim Wellsmore from Energy Consumers Australia, and welcome to all of you joining this webinar, A Consumer Perspective on Interconnector and Transmission Investment. It seems to have become even more timely this week than we anticipated when we first started thinking about doing this. All right, so before we move along and get into the meat of it, uh, I'd just like to acknowledge that we, uh, in our various locations, are meeting on Aboriginal land and pay my respects to elders past present and future. And I might just uh, provide a little bit of context, a little bit of housekeeping. So the basis for the webinar was a grant funded project, uh, the ECA funded the Tasmanian Small Business Council. Um, when they came to us with the application, um, it was certainly was in our remit as a grant project to fund. Um, and particularly important, we thought to support a consumer voice in these sorts of decisions, uh, not just about Marinus, but in this particular case, um, we were keen to make sure that consumers' interests were going to be front and centre in any of the decisions that were made going forward. At the same time, ECA's uh, view was that uh, consumers in other jurisdictions are facing similar decisions and similar proposals. So uh, there was great value in ensuring that the analysis done by TSBC and its partners, Goanna and Savvy, um, could be made available to other consumer advocates. Um, and initially the project was uh, going to have a, a workshop of advocates nationally, but in the current environment, that's just much more difficult to do, obviously. And um, so uh, ourselves and TSBC thought that uh, it was perhaps more useful to have a, a large webinar open to all stakeholders like this. So I'll uh, hand over to TSBC and the project team in a sec. Um, hopefully everybody was able to get the sort of the fairly basic agenda that was set out this morning. So at least you can sort of flow through and keep a track of who the various speakers are on the panel. Um, now, the other thing I just want to say in terms of housekeeping, the, the, we are recording the webinar and um, hopefully we'll be able to post it uh, later on our website at ECA. As some of you might feel that means you need to um, limit your input or the things that you're gonna ask in questions or some people might even feel that they need to withdraw at this point and obviously we respect that. Um, so um, <clears throat> as you can see from the agenda, uh, TSBC and its partners and primarily uh, Carl from Savvy will uh, do a presentation. Um, and then Catherine O'Neill from Spencer & Co has very kindly agreed to chair the panel and the Q&As. Um, now for the Q&As, the best way to deal with that is uh, at the bottom of your screen, there's a couple of buttons there. One's called chat, don't use that. There's one called Q&A, use that if you wanna ask a question uh, for the Q&A session. You're also able to uh, vote for a question. So rather than trying to um, ask the same question again to sort of make it look more important or whatever, there's a little thumbs up button. If you just click on that, uh, then there's also a voting system and that question then it becomes clear to Catherine and the other moderators that uh, that was particularly um, you know, keenly sought by the, uh, by the participants. All right, we'll try to get through all that as quickly as we can, obviously. Um, we might get to the end and have some questions that are not answered today, in which case um, we're gonna have a record of them all at ACA and um, possibly we can try and get some answers from um, panel members um, if there's anything particularly juicy um, to distribute uh, after the webinar. I'm also going to make available slides, a slide deck from TSB and Goanna and Savvy available. And uh, TAS Networks, I think, is going to give us some, uh, some, um, some slides as well that we'll be able to distribute to everybody afterwards. All right. Um, I think that's probably about it. At this point, then, I might just hand over to um, Robert Mallet and withdraw. Thanks again, everybody. Thanks very much, Jim. Um, and thank you very much to ECA. Uh, We've got now 64 on the on the call, and uh, that uh, represents people from all around Australia, which uh, we're particularly pleased with. I'd like to introduce the team that we've been working with, specifically Tasmanian Small Business Council um, contracted Goanna Energy, 
um, to undertake the work on our behalf. And so, just excuse a little bit, Mark White is the principal of Goanna Energy, who's with me, and somewhere here is John Devereaux, who's, uh, who did a lot of the grunt work. And then on your screen, you can also see Carl Daly from Savvy Consulting, based in Melbourne, um, and did a, a fantastic job for us. Um, I particularly like to thank ECA for their support, their knowledge, their professionalism, and the commitment to the consumer point of view of the energy marketplace. So without that, um, this project would not have got off the ground and we wouldn't have had the quality outcomes that I think that we currently have today. Um, so Carl, if you wouldn't mind sharing your screen. <clears throat> So what the project we undertook specifically was a consumer perspective of interconnector and transmission investment as a whole. However, because it concerned us with some of the costings that were uh, out there, especially potentially for Tasmanian consumers. And of course, because we were in Tasmania, we used Marinus, which is uh, top of mind at the moment for all of us here as the case study in particular. Uh, this morning, we're going to, next slide, sorry. Uh, tomorrow, this morning, next slide, Carl. Morning, this morning, so we've done a bit of an introduction. Um, we found there was issue to some degree with the regulatory investment test transmission um, when it came to a project as big as the one that we're dealing with today. We'll then go on to the project assessment draft report, key findings and, uh, and how we've actually interpreted and, and making comment on some of the findings that were made by TAS Networks whilst they were doing their draft report we'll then consider what might the next steps be for uh, consumers, what might the next steps be for TAS networks, what might the next steps be for interconnected transmission services around the country. And then we'll go to a Q&A panel uh, session, a brief one, just depending on uh, the Q&As there, and then we will, as Jim said, go to our, um, our formal panel session with a range of other people. Next slide. So specifically, the, the TSBC initiated this consumer review. Okay, I stress that it's a consumer review. Um, there'll be a whole range of people who will consider, ah, oh, yeah, but it's good for this, good for that, good for something else. Specifically, we took a consumer's point of view of the transmission proposal and used Marinus as the link. As I've discussed, next slide, next, the project was sponsored by Energy Consumers Australia, and without that, we could not have done the work that we've done. Go Energy, who I've introduced, uh, they undertook the project management, the regulatory research, and TSBC is doing the, uh, the advocacy, and Savvy Plus Engineering, Carl, who you'll hear from in a minute, undertook, undertook the market analysis and the research. Next slide. So, given that consumers somewhere along the line are going to have to pay for Marinus Link in some way, shape, or form, they should have a big say. And uh, Tasmanian Small Business Council, um, to some degree, and not bidden by, but on behalf of other consumers around the country, decided to, that we wanted to get in and have our, a big say in, as to how this could be. Because we were somewhat concerned that in fact, uh, the uh, PADR and the, all the assessments were doing, being done by an organisation that had a vested interest in its success to a large degree. Next slide. So whilst we, we're undertaking, we're, we're solution focused. Whilst we undertake a health check of the Marinus proposal, um, we want to be positive. It's not about obstructing anything. It's about helping get the best outcome for everybody, first up for consumers, and then of course, for energy users around Australia. And so we want to find the best solution. And we were unconvinced necessarily that Marinus and the way it was being proposed was in fact the best solution to support our energy needs across the eastern seaboard of Australia going on for not just the next year, two years, five years, 10 years, but 40 years, which is where we need to focus because Marinus is a 40 year project. So uh, along with the, the slides that you'll get to, we're going to see today, we actually have done a couple of uh, proposal or uh, productions. Uh, can the uh, the uh, RET-T uh, conclusions that we've done and a more lengthy written version of the review of the project assessment draft report, which was done for Marinus. I'd now like to hand over to Carl Daly, uh, who is going to go through the RIPT findings and then move on to the PADR key findings, which, uh, which were undertaken by the Tasmanian Small Business Council. Good. Uh, thank you, Robert. Yes, good morning, everyone. 
So as Robert explained, we're just going to walk you through the key findings, starting with the regulatory investment transmission test, and then we'll move on to the project assessment. So starting with the RIT-T, when we look at the RIT-T and think about the perspective that it takes, it really is looking at it from a private investor point of view. And therefore, it's evaluating everything um, as a private investment, and that's a perspective that it takes. But we look at it from a consumer point of view, we say to ourselves, well, in fact, it's the consumers that are forced to carry the lion's share of these risks. And when we say that, what, what do we mean? So let me just walk you through these consumer risks as we see it. They begin with technology, followed by market risks, modelling risks, and then finally regulatory risks. And the regulatory risk can take the form of the RIT-T process as we see it now, um, rule changes such as the five minute settlement change, which is coming, or indeed the ESBs looking at post 2025. All these risks we would say are actually being warehoused by the consumers. We think of the applications that the RIT-T is applied to, and it, it, in its typical form, it's designed or applied to a zone substation or augmenting transmission somewhere, which is one thing. But when we look at a large scale transmission investment, which has significant enhanced risks and investment scale, uh, we say, well, it's probably not suitable. And we use the Marinus link as a case study. So let me walk you through. So this is the key findings we come from. Um, we're drawn out of the project assessment. Our findings can be summarized in six steps and I'll begin with the answer first. Um, we begin with the conclusion, we're just not convinced. And I'll explain more in a moment. The second finding we make is that the consumer risks are understated. Thirdly, the modeling is questionable. Fourthly, we believe it fails to future-proof consumers. Fifthly, we believe that the proposed least regret solution is actually quite questionable. And trying to help solve the problem, we put up another one to suggest how about accelerating the consumer-led energy revolution. So let me just walk you through each of these six findings. The first one is the answer, we're unconvinced. So. As a community investor, not a private investor, but as a community investor, would we spend 193 million per annum on Marinus Link for the next 40 years? And we'll politely conclude, no thanks. However, we're not to say that others wouldn't. And so if others believe that it is commercially viable, well, that's okay. And they can clearly do so as an unregulated asset, such as what the Bass Link is today. We're also rec recommending that taxpayers' funds should not be used either directly or indirectly to make the investment given from a consumer point of view. We don't necessarily think it's in the best interest of consumers. So let's explain this a bit more. If I take you through the second finding. We say that consumer risks are understated. And by what we mean of that is in three areas. Firstly, technology. Second, modelling. Thirdly, market risks. And the modelling and the market risks, I'll talk about in our third finding, but for now, I'll just walk you through the technology risks. When we look at technology in our community and in our energy market, the risks in this space are huge. We know that there's lots of change going on. We know that the transition from fossil fuel to renewable is a global challenge, and therefore Australia, like many other global markets, are working out how to solve this problem. We know that technologies such as hydrogen is on the forefront and will probably come in some shape or form. We also recognise that Tasmania um, is pursuing hydrogen and leveraging off its natural assets. So we think of all these, all these risks and how this could change and we sort of say to ourselves, where are we now? We're here, sitting here in 2020. Um, Marinus Link will come on online as planned in fully operational in 2029, which is some nine years away, and then will run for the next 40. If we went back nine years and say, where were we? If we just think of simple things like an iPhone, the iPhone 4 was released back in 2011. Um, today we have an iPhone 11 Pro. The capability of that is vastly different. And what will something look like in nine years time? 
we think of the NEM. Solar, whether it be rooftop or utility scale solar with wind, represent only 3% of the market nine years ago. Today, it's on track at representing 17%. By the time we get to start this project, it's gonna be probably double that. So what would these changes look like in terms of consumers? We think of a consumer and the potential onslaught of home batteries which are coming. And we, we think of how artificial intelligence is gonna come with this. And we run the conversation with Alexa. Hi Alexa, I'm home. Welcome home, it's been a hot day. Yes, it was. Did we make any money exporting to the grid today? Yes, we made over a hundred dollars. I'll recharge the battery later tonight. Great, thanks. Then we move on to electric vehicles, which are coming. Hi Alexa, I'm home. Great, I'll play your favorite music. We'll be using the car tonight. Um, no, I'm fine. Great, I'll make you some money. Thank you. So artificial intelligence and the use of bi-directional use of electric vehicles is definitely within the foreseeable future. So we look at these consumer risks that are surround around technology and we can't help think about what we've called the Kodak risk. So we all know the Kodak business model got displaced and disrupted through a change in technology. And what worries us, are we facing the same thing with Marinus Link? Is it at risk of becoming redundant or certainly not delivering the benefits just through technology change and the way we think and use energy? So now I want to take you on to our modelling, which is our third finding. So we say that the modelling is questionable and we say that's in three areas. The first thing is the capital costs. The second is the market benefits. And then we have some puzzling aspects which would like to share our observations. In terms of capital costs, it's been modelled at a 2.8 billion project, yet we note it's quoted elsewhere at three and a half billion. And we particularly think of what's been mentioned in Tasmanian Parliament as recorded in Hansard. We note some of the TAS Network's media announcements and online sources talk about three and a half billion. So we say, what happened to three and a half? We've also got some concern about how the capital costs are being treated, um, but we'll leave that for later. Market benefits. The net market benefits have been developed um, as part of the PADR with TAS Networks, and this is a representation of those benefits over time. This is taking the status quo scenario. So the first thing to note is that these benefits really kick up in 2035. So in other words, from 15 years from now. So we look at that and say, okay, what can we say? We think of the higher modeling risk that one's carrying with something that's really gonna kick in 15 years time. We know for a fact demand forecasting, both the shape and the scale of, is, a, is very problematic to forecast. And if we look at any track record around that, it's been tough going to forecast that with any precision. We know that gas prices are linked to the LNG global market, which in turn is linked to the oil market, which we also recognise is very problematic to forecast. We have structural changes such as the five minute settlement, and we also have further reviews that will come no doubt in the next 15 years. We think of the technology changes and the step changes. We think of what hydrogen may or may not do. We think of the storage market, the behind the meter market, significant exposures um, to these changes are evident in the, in the business case. We know also that these benefits are in the future, so therefore they've had to be discounted back to today's value because we know that the capital costs we spent up front. So we need to bring forward the, or bring back the benefits in the future to today. We look at the discount rate of 5.9%, which has been used, which is straight out of the handbook, um, but we say it's really not risk adjusted from a consumer's point of view. We think of market reform risk. We know that the Energy Security Board is having a, re a review thinking about what happens post 2025. So where do all these benefits come from? Let me show you a busy diagram that comes out of the PDR, PADR. And this is showing um, the stacked area shows you the source of the benefits. And this gray area that you can see is from fuel switching. So what's fuel switching all about? It's really about 
the assumption that hydro will be able to run at a lower cost than gas. And so it's measuring the value of water, um, which is a bit nebulous to measure, but the value of water against a, a forecasted gas price. However, we say this is not the days of the State Electricity Commission of Victoria or the Hydroelectricity Commission of Tasmania, where we have integrated businesses and any cost savings will be passed through. We say that this pass-through assumption is only valid if there's perfect competition. And we know that's not true. We also know in the real world that marginal hydro generation is priced at or above gas generation. So therefore this cost switching um, is in our view questionable. And here's a little bit of evidence of, of that. If we look at the Victorian spot price for the last three years, and we look at who set the Victorian spot price, then coal is the dominant price setter, followed by gas and hydro around 20%. And they're very similar. We then look at hydro, and we note that it tends to be a higher price than when gas sets it. So here's prices grouped in bands across those three years, and this is a proportion of when of how and when gas set the price. We look at hydro, it's very common in that $50 to $100 price range, but when it gets in the $100 to $300, it tends to be more dominant setting the price. So this notion that this fuel switching benefit would be passed through to consumers, we're finding at the moment there's no evidence that that would be true. Let me take you now to our puzzled areas. We have three areas of where we're puzzled by. The first thing we say is, where are the large batteries? So this, um, the PADR uses the work that AMO had done in integrated system plan. And we look at the integrated system plan scenarios and none of them include any new batteries. Yet, we look at origin um, in an announcement to the shareholders talking about how they were in a disciplined way exploring 476 megawatts of large scale batteries across the NEM. We look at AGL, the publicly talked about exploring 380 megawatts of large scale batteries across the NEM. We look at an announcement just recently from Neo in and Mondo talking about a 600 megawatt battery farm near Geelong. So we, we say to ourselves, what's the implication for this? And for us, this raises a modeling red flag and if we're seeing a forecasting model, not predicting where participant behavior and decisions is going, we have to say that's a worry. So what does that mean in terms of our inputs or our methodology? There's something that needs some checking there. Our second puzzle is the modeling of the small batteries. It just doesn't look right. So here's the profile of the assumed summer profile, you, the deployment of batteries, and it's the blue line. So what it's saying, is it's discharging batteries during the middle of the day, during summer, and then overnight charging them up. We would say, why would you do that? Why wouldn't you discharge the batteries in the evening peak when the system's under stress and is in desperate need of additional capacity? And so by reflecting the small batteries that discharge in the middle of the day, you're overstating the generation supply need in the evening peaks, which leads to the need for more peaking plant, which leads to the need for projects like Marinus Link. Our third puzzle is how can Marinus Link plus the Battery of the Nation project be cheaper than building the Trove Valley gas turbines? We look at the capital costs. Marinus Link is talked of as $1.8 million per megawatt. Plus we bolt on the Battery of the Nation project, which starts at 1.5 million per megawatt. And we know that that's greater than what a Latrobe Valley gas turbine would be built at, which is 900,000 per megawatt. So how can that be true that the total cost is cheaper? It has to be because either high gas prices and high utilization of those assets mean that the variable cost outlays the penalty imposed on the capital costs. But we look at that and we say, well, that's significant risk in those assumptions around both the gas price, the value of the water, and indeed the utilization of the assets. And we note that ASOL Allen questioned the assumed number 
of running of these gas plants, saying it was way overstated, and therefore that leads to an overstatement of the benefits. We're also still concerned that this price benefit from fuel switching being passed through, we're saying, well, that's not necessarily true, and we're still worried about that being compressed, and therefore the benefits don't flow. So we look at these benefits that have been summarised, and in the meeting case, it's quoted at $1.1 billion for the status quo scenario. And this was evaluated under some sensitivity analysis using different discount rates. So we had the median case, which is sort of the base case at 5.9, and then we had a higher case and lower case. And the benefits flowing from these um, are shown in that chart below. And you can see as the discount rate increases, the benefits fall quite markedly. And this is not surprising, given most of the benefits begin in 15 years' time. But we say from a consumer point of view, if we use a risk-adjusted discount rate, and um, we use something like 12%, for example, then this thing is going to be very questionable in terms of whether it delivers benefits to the community. Let me take you to our next finding on future proofing. It really does... Marinus link, that is, fails to future-proof consumers. And we look at what Marinus is. It's a 40-year asset plus. It's unable to change, and we're stuck with a fixed annual charge as a result of that. And we think of how the future is going to play out. And let's look at batteries and solar. We know for batteries, here's a list of 10 disruptive technologies that were mooted two years ago. And we know that this market is a global market. It's subject to massive change and development. And the R&D that's going into, the, into battery technology for EVs as well as utility purposes is enormous. We know when we look at solar, we have solar tiles on emerging. We have solar glass. We have all different technologies and the use of solar, the flexible solar. It's moving in a very fast way and it's not going to be static. Our fifth finding talks about lease regret. The proposed lease regret solution we say is questionable. We also remind ourselves that lease regret solutions are not excuse for poor decisions. So we then look at the criteria of what is lease regret. And we go back to the ISP, and this is an extract out of that, and it says all the right things. We're minimising regrets, we're trying to find something with the least downside, we're potentially deferring investment or staging investment. We're selecting options which retain flexibility. And in the end of the day, we're trying to hedge the investment. All good. Then we look at Marinus Link. We look at the technology risks. It, it doesn't minimise risks. We look at the financial return. We say it, it has significant downside to it. We look at the costs of it and the way it's going to come in. It's not incremental. We look at future proofing, it, it's not flexible. So on any of the criteria that's set down, um, we struggle to see how the Marinus link actually stacks up to be classified as a project of least regret. So we're not trying to be negative, so we come up to be positive. And we say, okay, well, what is the solution? And we simply say, well, the problem we're facing or challenge we'd like to face is there a better way we can spend $193 million a year for the next 40 years? Or indeed, $250 million if the capital cost is closer to $3.5 billion. And we say, well, there probably is. And to get the discussion started, we created this project, which we called Battery Link. And what that's about is simply saying, why don't we subsidise home battery storage? And I know that there's already some state government initiatives in this space, but why don't we accelerate it even further? Why don't we orchestrate the use of that so we can manage capacity at the right time of the day and we can help with our voltage issues that solar PV is creating right across Australia? Why don't we create some price signals which are there and just simply pass them through? We've got the benefit of five minute pricing coming for the very purpose of being able to respond more quickly. And why don't we complement that with some gas power generation, say in Latrobe Valley, because we know under long runs, the batteries will go flat. So why don't we do something like that? And 
Then we worked through, well, what would be the benefits of such a project? We quickly worked out that it's probably about twice what the Mariner Sling status quo shows. And part of the reason why is that not only are we deploying the batteries at the critical peak time, so they create more market value, but also from a consumer point of view, it can avoid network charges, which is a, a, a cash stream or a revenue stream that any in front of the meter solution can't extract and deliver to consumers. So we're not pretending we've spent months um, building this business case out, but we're just saying just on a short period of time we had, we think there's other ways that could be explored. So finally, this brings us back to where we started. We're unconvinced. As a community investor, looking at spending this amount of money on Marinus and the benefits and the risks associated with it, you have to say politely, no thanks. So that takes us to our next steps. So I'm gonna hand it back to John now, who's gonna lead you through the next steps. my operator to unmute you. Thanks very much for that, Carl. Um, flowing out of the three major pieces of work we did, which was the RIPT analysis, the PADR review, and the consumer framework review, uh, we come up with a range of recommendations. So this is a very potted version of, of what those recommendations look like. So looking at the RIPT the, it, itself and looking at the analytical tools, we think that there needs to be an expansion, a mandatory expansion of the decision-making tools that are available to uh, network proponents when they're putting up these large proposals. We talked about the um, least regrets analysis. Well, that's part of the ISP, but it's not a requirement that any proponent uses uh, least regrets analysis as part of their work. And we think that that's something that needs to be addressed. Uh, and as Carl mentioned, least regrets analysis is but one tool. So we think there's a, a requirement to expand the decision-making tools that are, that are available to uh, RIPT proponents and uh, expand what they, they have to undertake. In terms of the scenario analysis and uh, options, uh, well, as Carl mentioned, in, in a relatively brief space of time, we've put together one uh, alternative to the construction of Marinus, which would be uh, to accelerate the, uh, the rollout of batteries and, and uh, local technology. That, that is but one option. And I think Carl mentioned also uh, the potential emergence of uh, hydrogen as an energy transfer mechanism. Well, there's another one. Um, those are the sort of scenarios that we can expect the uh, ESB to be contemplating in their 2025 review. So they should be part of the RIPT process, we believe. Uh, certainly in terms of uh, options, uh, the Marinus link proposal, for instance, considered options which relate to the size of the link, uh, 600, 750, 1500 megawatts, and they relate to the location of the link, but you're basically constrained to network solutions and particularly um, uh, interconnector solutions to address the challenges that are proposed. Uh, we think there, is, uh, there are many more options that should be contemplated as part of the RIPT. And we think it's necessary to test for consumer risks, um, including redundancy. And, and we think specifically, what are the risks, for instance, in Marinus that, that Marinus link is actually not required because of a range of reasons, say by, by, by 2035, say. Uh, well, what if that happens? Well, we believe that that should be tested explicitly uh, during the RIPT process. Thanks, Carl. At the ESB level, we think we, they should review the, uh, the RIPT process and Chapter 6A of the, uh, the rules, particularly to more clearly identify beneficiaries. And uh, we know from the work that TAS networks have done that the beneficiaries uh, for a Marinus link are actually mainland. Um, but, but exactly who benefits, you know, which, which beneficiaries are in, the, in, in amongst the um, the generators, is it generators that benefit? Is it consumers that benefit? Exactly who, where are those consumers? Uh, what class of consumers? And then make sure that the costs of the link are actually allocated to those beneficiaries. And uh, TES Networks has certainly done uh, plenty of work on that and made some 
recommendations and that of course is an issue that's currently alive which is you know, who will pay for the link and, and we don't know but that should not be an open question when these proposals are put forward in our view. Ms. Carl. At the AER level uh, we think you need to revisit the RIT-T guidelines including the use of discount rates and just to pick up on the point that Carl made uh, using a discount rate applicable to a regulated asset, which is determined by the rate of return process, as a mechanism for analysing the benefits of a very risky project like a Marinus link, which we just think is entirely inappropriate. And there should be a reflection in the discount rates that reflects consumer risk and business risk more genuinely. Um, we also think that it should be a mandate that an appropriate consumer body be established at the start of the RIT-T process uh, and particularly that that consumer body should not simply be an observer, they actually should have a role in determining uh, some of the outcomes and for instance the identified need is one that we think is particularly weak uh, and when you look at the identified need that's mandated by uh, or specified rather in the uh, RIPT rules at the moment, the guidelines. You know, it talks about being having a specific objective, it needs to be consumer focused, consumers need to be able to identify what is in it for them basically, and we think that the Marinus uh, identified need falls well short of that by being much more market benefit focused at the broadest level. Uh, from an EMO perspective, we think we'd like to see the AMO take on board the modelling issues that, that uh, Carl has raised and actually at the next version of the ISP specifically look at some of the points that we've raised. Uh, from TAS Networks, we'd like TAS Networks to revisit the PADR when they do their um, uh, final report uh, for the, as part of the RIT-T process, we'd like very much that TAS Networks actually take on board uh, the feedback that we've provided. Um, and uh, we think that there are likely to be some suggestions that we could pick up as uh, next steps and recommendations that come out of the panel discussion. So um, that's it from my end. Thank you. Over to Rob. So uh, Jim, I'm not sure whether you want to do questions and answers here and now or whether you feel that might be more appropriate come the panel session. I'm happy to leave it in your hands. Well, <clears throat> unless, unless there's anything terribly pressing right at the stage, I think it might actually work better to move into the, um, the panel discussion, um, mainly because uh, <clears throat> um, uh, there's people on the panel that uh, will uh, be able to um, make some, some you know, probably some very helpful comments about that presentation. So we, unless there's any objections or people want to sort of jump into the Q&A and start throwing things in there, I think we'll just move along. But thank you very much, uh, particularly to Carl and also to John um, and to you, Robert, for pulling together such a good team there. Um, that was uh, that was terrific. So I'll just jump into the panel, I think. And um, um, I'm happy to let uh, our uh, chair do the intros, but I will introduce the intro for Catherine. Catherine Neal, uh, who might be known to uh, many of you, um, has had a long uh, and fabulous career in uh, energy networks, transmission and distribution, and currently is a principal at Spencer & Co and is doing some fantastic work for Energy Consumers Australia in relation to distribution resets in Victoria. So uh, I might just uh, let you take it from here, Catherine. Thank you very much, Jim. Um, I'm delighted to be asked to chair this panel. Um, I must say that um, I haven't looked at links in Tasmania for 20 years, so it's been a, um, a quick learning curve, but it's a fascinating project and I think it certainly raises some of the key issues facing the NEM at the moment. Um, I'm delighted to have a panel of such learned experts who um, seem to know everything about interconnectors and Marinus Link which is great. Um, firstly, Stephen Clark, who represents um, TAS Networks and the Marinus Link project, and we'll hear from Stephen shortly. Um, Andrew Nance, who's the director of um, the Energy Project, who, a private consultant um, who's been involved in some of the analysis for the 
uh, what is it called, Power Connect, um, interconnector from South Australia to New South Wales. And uh, Project, Project Energy Connect, they call it. Sorry, Project Energy Connect. It's got all the buzzwords in it. It's just the right order. Um, and um, Mi Miyuru Edawira from PIAC, um, who's a consumer advocate and uh, been involved in lots of projects, mostly uh, focused in New South Wales, but like all these things, they have much broader reach. So um, Euro's had some uh, involvement in some of the interconnector discussions today. So welcome all and um, thank you for making the time. Um, Stephen, perhaps we could start with you. Uh, this is your project, Marinus, that's uh, the guinea pig um, in terms of the analysis here. Perhaps you would like to um, give your response to Goanna's findings and recommendations. Right, thanks, Catherine. Uh, I'm sure everyone can hear me okay. All good. Um, yeah, the, um, I think I'd like to just take us back to, I guess, the problem we're trying to solve here. Uh, just to put this project in context, uh, the NEM is facing this huge change away from thermal generation uh, to renewable generation um, and mostly uh, variable renewable generation. What we're seeing and what's um, uh, both the ISP forecast and um, generator says by 2035, for example, over 12 gigawatts of thermal generation is likely to, to retire. Now to put that in context, um, that's roughly the same as the peak demand of, of South Australia and Victoria combined. And uh, today we read that actually by 2040, about 60% of the NEMS thermal generation uh, or about 15 gigawatts of, uh, of thermal generation is going to retire by 2040. So there's a huge change, um, a transition coming in the next 15 to 20 years. Uh, and the same analysis that we've done and the ISP's done is that the cheapest solution going forward is renewable, variable renewable and solar and wind uh, in particular, but it needs to be firmed up by dispatchable capacity. Uh, and at dispatchable capacity, um, our modeling for the central case is around about eight gigawatts of dispatchable capacity AMOs in their ISP is somewhere between six and 19 gigawatts of new dispatchable capacities required uh, to, to support that one. And, and the reason I'm, I'm sharing this, uh, these numbers here uh, is that um, uh, we, the, the presentation we heard from Goanna was sort of um, saying, this is a really big investment, um, there's big risks uh, involved. But I actually look at it in that scale where actually we need to find let's say somewhere between eight, 10, maybe 19 gigawatts of, 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 of dispatchable capacity. And all of a sudden, Marinus actually looks like quite a small part of a big puzzle that needs to be solved. Uh, we're a small part of a big of the solution that's required. And in our view, there's a role for um, the distributed generation, distributed batteries. Uh, no, Battery Link, absolutely, uh, has a role to play in there. But we also need other solutions as well and our analysis shows that that uh, Marinus still drifts um, delivers lower costs to consumers um, in conjunction with batteries uh, in conjunction with gas fire generation uh, in conjunction with other pumped hydro on the mainland now it's actually a combined picture that's required here not just a single one um, so to pull some numbers out of the of what we're trying to achieve here I mean if you try to have the uh, use um, equivalent batteries uh, to give the same level of capacity and energy storage that Marinus will bring to the NEM. Uh, you're talking at a uh, grid scale, like a Hornsby type um, battery thing, talking about $12 billion of investments in batteries uh, to give that same level as Marinus will bring. Uh, if you talk about Tesla Powerwalls, you're probably talking about $15 billion uh, of batteries required. Uh, to give the same level of capacity and storage that Marinus uh, gives. So I'm not saying that we don't um, deliver and use these uh, batteries. I think that's a great, uh, we need consumers to be more involved in this. Um, but as well as that short term, and that you do also need, there's, there's extra, there's value in the medium and the really deep um, storage that Marinus unlocks uh, in there. Um, so I think that's, it's not an either or. Um, in terms of us looking back on some of the rec recommendations that go and put in there, uh, 
Um, we certainly agree that the RITC needs to understand the distrib distributional benefits uh, of who benefits from Marinus, and particularly a bit of the customer focus there. Um, probably where we uh, will probably disagree is that how you deal with uncertainty um, uh, in, the, in, the, in the analysis. Um, and that's been obviously a key focus of, uh, of Goanna's report. And it's been, and I certainly welcome the fact that they've put a spotlight on the questions, uh, various aspects of the uncertainties um, of the NEM going forward. But what I would say is that the way that the RITC does, looks at this and note, and the RITC is just basically a, uh, a economic cost benefit analysis. Uh, there are accepted, uh, and dare I say, best practice ways of dealing with those uncertainties. You know, and the way that the ISP and the way that we do that as part of the RITC is to do it through sensitivity analysis, do it through scenarios, making sure that we've um, looked at the right options um, there. Um, uh, and generally, I think the generally accepted view, that's better than trying to capture those uncertainties in, dis in high discount rates or capture that um, through things like just assuming there's no value of the link past 20 years um, uh, or skewing all your forecasts to be worst case. That's a very blunt way of looking at uncertainty and quantifying uncertainty. So um, we think that the, the methodology used uh, in there, while difficult, uh, is um, uh, still the best way going forward. Um, just don't think on that. Um, yeah, so the, oh, just the other one still I just noticed, uh, I wanted just to correct too. Um, the RITC, um, while we um, look at the identified need as uh, looking at the interconnection, the comment was there that we don't look at non-network solutions, and that's actually a misreading of our RITC. We certainly do look at non-network solutions. We have looked at batteries, um, we looked at uh, uh, large and small, uh, we looked at demand side management, we looked at a range of non-network solutions mm -hmm. in our RITC. So, uh, so I just want to lay that idea, idea to bed. Um, but absolutely, absolutely welcome the suggestions that customers and consumers should be more involved, absolutely critical in my mind. Um, we actually want the best solution. Um, the, the whole purpose of building interconnectors is to, to increase competition in the NEM and to lower um, the cost to consumers from what it otherwise would be. Uh, and so if an interconnectors can't demonstrate it's doing that, then it shouldn't be built. Um, so um, looking forward to a great discussion on those points, but I uh, just wanted to address those. And as um, Jim mentioned, We've, we're putting together a bit of a presentation just so that we don't spend the whole time on this um, rebutting every slide of, of going. So we're put a, putting up a presentation together which ECA will, will make available for anyone who's interested. Thanks, Catherine. Very good. Thank you, Stephen. Um, you raised um, some scary sounding numbers of billions and billions of dollars of batteries um, or the equivalent in batteries and the fact that Marinus is just one part of a much bigger solution to deal with um, the, the closing down of thermal generation. Perhaps we should go to the consumer advocates then. Um, Yuru, you have, um, you've been involved in some of the uh, similar issues uh, looking at the ISP and what it's forecasting and what that means for customers when they end up paying for it. What do you think are the issues that Marinus raises that you think are more broadly applying to the NEM? Yeah, so, I mean, as you say, we've been involved in a lot of the kind of ISP and a lot of the other projects that deal with sort of NEM-wide strategic reforms like this. Um, and we've come up with a bit of a framework to really govern how we approach these and how we want to see that transformation of the NEM really kind of uh, flow through. And the first part of that is really identifying the most efficient solution overall for the whole of the system. Um, and that's talking about sort of treating both supply and demand side options on an equal footing. That really goes to options like the battery link that, um, that Carl talked about, um, but also factoring in things like climate resilience and future proofing, given that these are, are big projects and you're kind of locking in um, solutions and it's quite um, difficult at times to unwind something that's already built. The second part of it is really delivering um, that timely and efficient solution so that's uh, by incentivizing the responsible parties to not only deliver the solution, but also make sure that the full modeled consumer benefits are actually delivered um, to consumers. And that's about kind of risk allocation. 
Um, and then the third one is about recovering costs. So we like um, a beneficiary pays model um, that as the most sort of equitable and fair way of uh, recovering those costs. And Marinus Link and a lot of the other ISP projects that um, affect national flow paths throughout the NEM um, really expose two uh, fundamental assumptions of how transmission projects um, and sort of centralized generation more broadly is planned and um, costs are recovered and risks are allocated. And the first assumption is that the benefits um, of those investments accrue primarily to the same region where those physical assets are located. Um, obviously for an interconnector, that's not necessarily true. Um, if you have you know, most of the assets on one side of a state border, it doesn't necessarily mean that most of the benefits will also accrue to that same side of the state. Um, and then when you start talking about national flow paths, um, you start having um, sort of benefits also accruing to other regions that aren't immediately um, affected by those networks. For instance, um, so sort of as you have power flowing from Queensland down to Victoria through New South Wales or vice versa. Um, and the issue is that the, the cost recovery framework um, doesn't really reflect this. Transmission costs sort of primarily um, are recovered from the same region where a physical asset is located. Mm -hmm. There are interregional um, sort of QOS and other mechanisms, but it, it, it's um, kind of fiddling at the edges to put it uh, quite simply. Um, and then the second assumption that these um, projects expose is that um, it assumes that uh, consumers are the direct beneficiaries of a lot of transmission investments. Um, and we're seeing with a lot of uh, ISP projects that there are consumer benefits in terms of reliability and um, resource adequacy, um, but a lot of other projects actually do are there to um, unlock new renewable generation potential, um, which is definitely in the, the interest of consumers to, to lower wholesale costs um, and to accelerate the transition to a low emissions future. But the direct beneficiaries of that aren't consumers. They're going to be generators and renewable developers. And that's kind of where the primary costs and the risks should be allocated to reflect that. And so that's one of the, the wicked problems that things like renewable energy zones is currently grappling with. Um, and there are methods and frameworks out there to better allocate costs um, in a way that, benefit, that uh, reflects where the direct beneficiaries are. Um, and should point out that even though, you know, consumers will ultimately bear the costs for those generators and developers, but that'll only flow through if those investments in the transmission or the generation are actually efficient and successful in a, a private sort of competitive market, only efficient costs get passed through. And if they're not efficient, they're overblown or they're, they're earlier than needed, those can be um, written off or written down. Mm -hmm. You can't really do that under, under the current frameworks for regulated transmission assets. So those are some of the big issues that we see from Marinus Link is a, a good kind of case study of a lot of those, um, but also with a lot of the other ISP projects, as I said. So just a few small items of homework then for uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> in the national electricity market. That's good. We've we'll all keep us in a job for the next 20 years. Um, Andrew Nance is the other member of the panel. Um, you've been involved in the Energy Project Connect. What do you see as the risks or failings of the current processes for approval of such large infrastructure projects? Um, thanks, Catherine. So I guess to be clear, the um, work we did, uh, the Energy Project is a, is a small consulting firm. There's a, a small number of us that um, operate independently and we're largely focused on distributed energy and we work with energy customers on, on trying to work out where they should spend their money, whether it be getting better energy contracts or investing in solar and batteries and so on. So I guess the, the approach we took was to look at this, you know, if you're a customer that consumes energy, does this represent a good investment? And um, there's nothing quite like analysing a project when you're spending other people's money. And I think that's you know, one of the great failings of this, um, of this process is that um, with all of the uncertainty, uh, the risks are borne by the consumers. And, and you know, it, otherwise it's, uh, these are regulated investments that end up on the regulated asset base of, of uh, monopoly transmission providers. And so that, that, allocation of risk could never be said to be an efficient allocation, I think, under this. Um, look, 
I guess there's a couple of things. Uh, interconnectors, I think, you know, they have they have a place, as as Stephen said, but the, but not at any cost. Like these are really expensive assets. So uh, the ISP 2020 came out overnight. The um, article that covered it in in a today's um, Adelaide Advertiser talked about how the um, uh, the estimate of cost had increased some 70% uh, from what was originally mooted as 1.53 billion to now anything up to 2.6 billion, which swamps all of the potential benefits anyway. And I'm sure there'll be uh, some work done to try and find some additional benefits to keep justifying this project. But um, really, it's it's uh, from a consumer perspective, I think that's going to be very difficult to maintain. But it has political momentum, and I guess that combination of the politics as well as the um, you know the the economic um, assessment uh, is going to compromise uh, the result for consumers. And I think that's one of the challenges as well. These things are very pointable. There's lots of opportunities for photos for politicians with high vis vests, cutting ribbons and digging holes and all that sort of junk that we see quite often. Um, but in terms of your, your original question, I guess I wanted to focus on the concept of risk. And this is something I think Carl's work and, and the work that uh, Goanna and um, the TSBC have done is fantastic because it really does emphasise these um, this concept of risk. So I always like to restate and make, uh, the Australian and international standard definition of risk, which is the effect of uncertainty on objectives. So I just wanted to quickly talk about uncertainty and then talk about objectives. Um, so. Uh, I think the presentation from Carl really outlined that there is a whole range of, of risks here or a whole range of uncertainties about the future energy market and what it is that um, uh, the market will look like going forward um, when these things are actually built and over this enormous time frame over which they need to these benefits need to be realised to justify these massive investments up front. Um, the discussions about discount rates in my previous uh, time on the AER's Consumer Challenge Panel, this was certainly something that me and my colleagues were trying to impress on the AER and others, that uh, you need a discount rate that actually reflects the risks in, inherent in the project, not the rate of return of a, of a regulated um, monopoly. Uh, didn't get very far. I can see it's still an issue, um, but I would encourage those that are involved in these to continue with that. Um, but normally, uh, I guess if you're a business and you're looking at these sort of things, your investments in your energy infrastructure based with uncertainty um, going forward, you should be looking at staging your investment or looking at more incremental investments rather than going all in on the basis that it would um, probably repay itself over 20 plus years. And I just think, you know, you'd, it's impossible to draw a parallel between what uh, our client, business customers, what they would invest in and, um, and what consumers are being asked to invest in um, in these interconnectors. Um, and the other bit, so risk, the effect of uncertainty on objectives, it goes back to that question then of objectives. What are our objectives here? What is the problem we're trying to solve? And I think um, uh, John Devereaux mentioned this as well, that you know the idea of the identified need is a really central part of the RIT-T. It should be based on the, um, the interests of consumers, the long-term interests of consumers, which is the national electricity objective. It's not, unfortunately. It, um, uh, but it should be, and it could be. Um, I'll give, Stephen should have the opportunity to, to I guess, outline what the um, uh, identified need is for um, uh, Project Marinus, but I don't believe the word consumer is in there anywhere. Um, the limitation, I guess, in terms of the RIT-T then comes down to it's uh, structured around maximising benefits to all who produce and consume um, in the market. And not only is that a problem that we've got a focus on the production and consumption, which means there's the ability to extract rents and, and, and therefore not let these benefits fall to consumers, which is very much part of Carl's analysis, which I think is very welcome. But it also drives you towards this idea that you're maximising benefits, drives you towards building big things. Mm. Um, it's not about what's the best return on investment, which is what us normal humans pursue. It is about maximising the benefits. So if you have to spend, you know, a billion dollars to get um, two dollars back, that is a better investment than spending a hundred million dollars to get one dollar back. And that is always going to lead you to build big things. And for those of us in sunny South Australia, uh, big interconnectors are actually a problem because they're not always there. And when they fall over, the lights go out. And that is still a risk which isn't faced when you spend the same amount of money pursuing more distributed investments. 
Okay, thank you, Andrew. I think um, living in South Australia, you have a particular um, perspective that I think that most of us in the rest of the states don't have, well haven't experienced. Luckily, um, yes. Yes, I'm not sure that's a sort of badge you want to wear permanently. Um, I've just perhaps we could move to some questions that are coming in from some of the participants. Um, one of the first questions that came in was uh, a question that's similar to one I asked uh, the panel a couple of days ago, and that was what, when we're looking at building a new link, surely we should be looking at some sort of ex post evaluation of BassLink. And I think, John Devereux, you gave me a pretty good answer to this when I asked the question a few days ago. Perhaps you'd like to uh, re-spin your answer. Okay, thanks, Catherine. Well, look, there's a couple of aspects to it. The first is that there was a review in 2000, and I think it was 12 by uh, expert uh, panel. Uh, an expert panel which looked at the, the whole um, BassLink number one um, investment and the relative merits of it. So that, that's always available. And But, but look, I, I would go back to the point that it really depends on what your identified need is. And... I think that's a very relevant issue now because BassLink was put in place not so much as a, a means of connecting the two regions for interregional benefit. The reason why BassLink was built because it was then the next cheapest alternative generation supply to hydro. And uh, those of us that were about back then remember that it was the Hawke government that... Uh, Put the kibosh on what was then proposed by way of the Gordon Below Franklin Dam and uh, power scheme. Uh, so that meant that hydro development was no longer available. And um, in looking at what the options were for the state, the then hydro said simply that, well, when you look at all the options we've got, you know, uh, oil fired, thermal power stations, etc., actually connecting to the mainland and accessing coal-fired generation paying for the link would be our cheapest source of energy. So it was a generation solution. Mm -hmm. uh, part of the business case uh, for that solution was that by way of uh, interregional trading, uh, buy cheap, sell expensive, at times when we're not importing, uh, that would offset to some extent the costs of the link and the cost of the energy purchases that we make. Um, so just, just going back to the point, the identified need was more generation um, and it was the cheapest option as identified by the then hydro. Um, that's a very different proposition to what the link is basically used for now, which is trading and, and optimising the benefits of trading across the link. Um, and it's very different to the identified need for a marinus, which is about uh, providing deep storage access uh, to complement renewable energy for the mainland. It's not a Tasmania issue. Tasmania doesn't need Marinus Link. It's about uh, providing um, uh, firming capacity to renewable energy on the mainland. Now, that's a very different proposition to what Bass Link was. And therefore, I guess my view would be that the um, uh, benefits of evaluating the BassLink case, which has already been done, um, uh, you'll, you'll have a different perspective altogether. So different purposes, different identified needs, the lessons are, are not going to be directly comparable. Okay, thank you, John. I think that's a great example of how identifying the need is so critical to the solution that you choose. And um, certainly drought proofing Tasmania was a big driver of that investment, as I recall. Um, we'll go to a question put by an anonymous uh, attendee. Um, and the question is, isn't the issue faced so, so large that we need all the options, batteries, solar, wind, gas, and and interconnectors and aren't we hoping for batteries to be commercial for battery link to work and the comment is based on the national renewable energy laboratory and csi csiro forecasts the battery of the nation still seems cheaper a cheaper energy option than batteries or gas even po until post 2040 won't tasmania miss out of more renewable energy development 
including jobs and lower prices if battery leak occurs, even despite the large scale renewables are, significant cheap, are significantly cheaper than rooftop solar. But I think this question goes to, you know, what are the benefits of Tasmania and won't the Marinus Link facilitate a whole lot of extra jobs and particularly development of wind assets in the northwest? Stephen, do you want to have a crack at that? Yeah, certainly you can, Catherine. Um, yeah, so um, for Tasmania and, I mean, from, from John's right in terms of, you know, in terms of the NEM side of things, uh, Tassie doesn't need more dispatch We've got a really good source. In fact, we've got excess dispatchable capacity in Tasmania. For Tassie, it's an export, export opportunity to export what we've got that the rest of NEM needs. Uh, and, and for Marinus, uh, its business case effectively is using existing hydro to start with and then the potential to build pumped hydro in the future um, with a second link and as well as um, the renewable energy, uh, winds, wind farms in particular. Tassie also has a great uh, wind resource uh, that's very cost effective in the NEM. Uh, so there are jobs and growth uh, to be had here. Um, now that's not part of the BIT uh, We don't assess that. It's not something that we, um, that we put there and, and uh, in the economic analysis. But uh, I guess as a policy, as a policy perspective and a consumer perspective, um, the, the fact that the, the overall economy is better off um, through uh, uh, developing those cost-effective solutions, I think is a, is a plus for Mariners. Um, Catherine, can I also say, and I hear Stephen, but at the same time, um, uh, that, that is something that needs to be put uh, much more clearly. I know there's been an Ernst Young report and Asel Allen have done something about, you know, towards this, but um, I'm not sure that those benefits are clearly enunciated and there needs to be a much clearer indication as to at what point do Tasmanians pay, you know, like this, this, this should be an investment and most people make a, a return on their investment and the state of Tasmania could well make a return on its investment. But at the moment and from a consumer perspective, the way the Marinus has been put with the RIT-T and the, the current PADR, um, that's why we've come up with our recommendations and our outcomes is that it's not showing that investment. If there was a much broader project to uh, add in 10, 20 and 30 year, um, 40 year outcomes for what does happen to Tasmania, how much will its uh, economy grow as a result of this level or any projected level of renewable investment, um, we may have had come to with a slightly different conclusion. But at the moment, in the absence of that, um, that's why we've done the report and our conclusions are as they are. Um, and if I could follow on from that, thanks Robert. Um, Talking about the renewable energy resource, and I guess this comes back to the whole issue of looking broadly, having a, a, a genuine long-term strategic focus, which I would venture is somewhat lacking at a, at a national level and at a state level. Um, an example would be all of that available renewable energy, bearing in mind that, that an interconnector doesn't produce energy, it transfers energy from one location to another. That's, that's the role of an interconnector. Um, and it provides access to storage, for instance, in, in, the, in the case of um, hydro and, and snowy. It enables the, the national grid to, to access those deep storages. Uh, another way to transfer energy, though, uh, in the future, and bearing in mind we're talking about a future which is you know, nearly 60 years out. By the time Marinus is built and then you add a 40 or 50 year asset life, you're talking about 60 years out. And in 60 years, uh, I would pose the question, what, what will the hydrogen economy look like? What, what role will hydrogen play in uh, transferring energy from one place to another? Because Tasmania could take all of its renewable energy output, produce hydrogen and export hydrogen to the world, uh, including uh, the mainland. So uh, I don't think, I don't believe that Marinus Link is necessarily the only option available to optimise Tasmania's renewable energy resources. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why I think scenario planning and options analysis is lacking uh, in the current processes. Thanks, John. Um, Stephen, you almost sounded like a jobs and growth political candidate. Um, we just smacked of um, Tony Abbott amongst others. But um, 
I'm just wondering, there's a question here from Jack Gilding asking, Stephen, can you elaborate on your statement that ta the TAS Network's RIP-T process uh, does not look at non-network solutions, or sorry, does look at non-network solutions, and did TAS Networks develop alternative scenarios, or does it use the scenarios in the draft ISP? Okay, thanks. Um, so, elaborate. So, what our methodology, and sorry to dive in a little bit of detail here, but um, I find it interesting. Uh, the, the way that we do our analysis uh, is do a with and without analysis. So we say, well, how will the NEM develop without Marinus? Uh, or how's it likely to develop? And how's it likely to develop with Marinus? When we do the world without Marinus, we actually let, let the model choose, uh, if it wants to, battery developments, um, uh, uh, demand side management, uh, wind and solar placements and gas um, placements. So the model has got all those things it can choose. We tell it the costs of those things, the, the capital costs and the operating costs, and the model then goes and, and then constructs a future uh, of the NEM as coal retires and as the load changes uh, that meets the requirement, that meets supply to customers. Um, we then put Marinus in and say, well, okay, if you've got Marinus in there, how, do, how does that NEM cha development change? Uh, do we build more or less um, wind and solar? Where do we do it? Do we build more or less batteries? And we see overall, what's the cost to supplying the NEM, supplying the electricity? Is it lower when we have Marinus there or is it lower without? Uh, and so implicit in that um, approach is the idea that without Marinus, the model has to use other things like batteries, um, like gas, generation uh, um, and potentially uh, demand management in there. And the model picks out what would it cost to do the exact same thing as Marinus with those other options. And that's how we, we factor in that demand, the, the non-network solutions in there. So while it's not an explicit option in the option category in, the, so in our pattern, uh, it is implicit in how we look at the with and without, um, without Marinus. Um, now, the second question was, Oh, Second part of the question. Uh, let me go back to where it was. Sorry. Oh, it's disappeared from my screen. Oh, sorry. But just listen, I, I, it's 12.40 and um, we're due to... Oh, we've got plenty of time. Sorry, this Q&A is going to 1.25, so we've got plenty of time. Okay, good. Um, I'll try and find that the second part of the question for you. But, <laughs> Part of the question was TAS networks um, developing alternative scenarios or just using the scenarios in the draft ISP. Okay, thank you. Uh, yes, yeah, so we have focused our scenarios, so they're very similar to the ISP, and that's sort of been, we've been encouraged to do that by a number of submissions uh, on our PADA um, and the AR. So our, our scenarios are broadly um, similar to, and actually very close to, to the ISP scenarios. We have put a few extra uh, in there as well. We thought it was really important. I mean, for example, after actually talking with uh, John and the Goanna team um, last year, we did a, an extra sensitivity around batteries and said, well, what happens if the cost of, of batteries decreases twice as fast as what AMO suggests? What does that do to the economics? We did that as a sensitivity. Um, we've also done things like uh, difference in inflow. Um, so what happens if climate change changes the uh, amount of inflow into the hydro storages? We've done a range of extra sensitivities that we thought uh, were really important to know about that might impact Marinus as well as the, the uh, AEMO one. So we sort of very much saw AEMO as sort of the scenarios, the ISP scenarios as a base, um, and we'll build on that. I did note that we didn't actually do a high DER scenario last time, which AEMO did. Um, so we're not look at that this time around, uh, but we've we tried to align our scenarios as close as we can. Okay, thanks, Stephen. Um, we'll just go to another question about the battery link. I know that um, the Goanna team have put forward the battery link as one option, but and not necessarily the solution. But the question um, is: Is there a, de a more detailed description of the battery link model than is currently presented in the? Uh, review by the TSBC. John or Mark, do you want to take that comment? You might need to unmute. I think that's one for Carl, Catherine. Oh, sorry, my apologies, Carl, unmute. Um, no, there's, there's not, we haven't published anything. So what's we, in one of the reports, we wrote down the assumptions and the of the battery and the like. 
but we didn't release, um, I guess, all the details. Um, not, not that we're necessarily uh, trying to hide anything. It, it's just, we're just, just trying to be more thought-provoking. And if I take up sort of Stephen's comments, it, it's not just the question of um, the capital cost of these batteries, it's how you use them. I think that's the point we're making. And, it, and we still say it's surprising that the ISPs behave, is choosing, not choosing batteries when the market is. So that fundamentally says to me that the way the models are assuming these batteries have been deployed is very different to the way the actual owners are looking to use it. And I think that's the point of view. Okay, um, thanks, Carl. One of the questions put forward is, um, if there's a problem here in terms of perceived benefits and who's going to pay, um, is there an option for Marinus Link to be put forward as a merchant link in the same way that Bass Link would um, always currently run? I guess the second part of that question is, if, there, if it's a nation building project, um, you know, why wouldn't governments fund it separately? Um, Catherine, if I could venture an answer on that. Um, I think uh, the PADR makes it fairly clear that the, the uh, choice between a merchant link and a regulated link is, is still unresolved because it could be a merchant link, it could be a regulated link, it could be a hybrid link, a hybrid of the two. But I guess the, the fact that uh, TAS Networks is the proponent of the, the uh, business case at the moment going through the RIPT process means that it is being proposed as a regulated link. So uh, I, I, I might have missed something there, but that's certainly my understanding. And it is um, up for uh, anybody to invest in a, in a non-regulated link at any time as part of part of the market arrangements. And I guess the difference there is that if, um, if uh, let's just say a wind generator were to decide that uh, we, we believe that there's enough of a, a market there for us to put our product into the mainland uh, and we can produce wind energy so cheaply in Tasmania that we can pay for the, uh, the cost of that link and get the uh, energy into the national market through Victoria cheaper than what it can be produced in Victoria or elsewhere, uh, they would say, well, look, we, we, we're going to stump up three and a half billion dollars and, and we'll do that ourselves. There, there's nothing to stop that happening at any time. Um, and uh, um, so, so I guess it's, it's, uh, it is a reality that regulated links are necessary when there is what is seen as a market failure. In other words, nobody is stepping up to the plate to, to make that sort of investment. And I guess going back to the earlier comments, carry the risks that go with that investment. Nobody's stepping up to the plate. Um, and what you have is in fact the opposite to that where uh, generators uh, and, and, and I guess I use the term uh, vested interests are suggesting, uh, as it was earlier mentioned to the politicians uh, that are, uh, are looking for the uh, the uh, high biz and, and spade ready opportunities. Look, this is a good idea. And by the way, we would benefit from that, but that's a side issue because this is really a, a national issue. Um, and, um, uh, you know, um, that, that's the way things tend to play out. Um, but it is uh, regulated links are required when there is a market failure where um, businesses will not make the investment that the national market operator sees as being beneficial. Okay. Yeah. I jump in just to add a little bit to that one, Catherine. Yeah. Uh, Go ahead. Um, so, from from my perspective, and I think it's useful to look at the, the unregulated model and the fact that we've had three three links being built under it. Two of them have decided to convert to regulated because, really, the current regulatory framework doesn't isn't doesn't make uh, merchant links actually viable. Uh, and one of the reasons for that uh, is that the benefits of interconnections flow beyond just the two regions that they're uh, connecting. Uh, and under the current way that, um, that merchant links get rewarded, which is the arbitrage between the two regions, they don't get to access uh, all those benefits. And that's a little bit shown in, in the, the work that we did and the PADA uh, shows how um, the benefits of Mariners flow right across to them. And there's significant benefits to New South Wales and even up to Queensland. Um, uh, and so you can't capture those benefits in the current market model. Um, so 
I guess our view is that no one could actually commercialise uh, Mariners Link as an MNSP because of that. Okay. Um, just, just following on from that point, um, after, I guess that's uh, that's one of those uh, issues that uh, the, the uh, TAS Network's PADR flags and in, in the work that we flag is that uh, Stephen's absolutely right. The benefits uh, are spread quite broadly, um, but there's a complete disconnect uh, between who pays in, in terms of where the costs are allocated and the beneficiaries. And that's a challenge that we've flagged that needs to be addressed. And uh, TAS Networks have uh, made that same point. Great. And in the same in the same vein, I suppose, a bridge across a river to get cars from one side to the other, you know, to what level does a cost benefit analysis do? Um, and when the Commonwealth decides to stump up for a very expensive bridge, um, we don't always ask uh, you know, who pays, etc. The Commonwealth have decided there's a bridge to link two communities. And uh, maybe that's, that's where this answer is, that uh, maybe the Commonwealth need to decide that, uh, and they did according to the ISP release today, that this is to some degree a project of some national significance. Um, maybe they may end up choosing that uh, they are the ones who will fund it uh, in some way, shape or form. And the Tasmanian consumer is not the person who will necessarily have to bear those costs. That would certainly be a good outcome for Tasmanians um, compared to the alternative, which I understand from you, Stephen, is a deal breaker for Marinus Link. Um, if the current cost allocation uh, rules apply, that Marinus Link just couldn't wouldn't be supported by TAS Networks, is that right? That's right. So we've both asked the state government and TAS Networks have said that uh, unless we can get the allocation appropriately so that uh, there's a fair allocation of the costs according to the benefits, similar to what Gowen is saying, then we shouldn't proceed with Mariners Link. It would I mean, it would sort of seem absurd that Tasmanian customers would end up subsidising um, mainland customers for the lower cost energy um, in there. Um, can I actually just, just stopping back to a point that um, John made about hydrogen as well, um, as in terms of that. Uh, it's, um, we've done some modelling around hydrogen uh, and, and from what we see actually is that there's, once again, there's actually room for both in terms of hydrogen and Marinus Link. Um, in fact, actually they work quite well together with the Tasmanian policy around CRET. Um, so once again, I think uh, um, it shouldn't be an either or. I think there's actually scope for um, uh, all options um, as we go forward. Okay, uh, we've talked a bit about um, the options for Mariners Link. Maybe we could move on a bit to the cu customer involvement in the process. Um, Consumers are already invited to be involved in these sorts of processes. Um, and Miru and Andrew, you've both been involved in these interconnector uh, projects uh, to date. Um, perhaps I can put the question to you. What do you think of the current level of customer involvement in these projects? And do you think it's sufficient to get the outcomes that will benefit customers? Um, who wants to start? Andrew, you're not. I'd just I'd make the comment that there's a huge difference between opportunity to be involved and capacity to stay involved. Like these projects are analysed in great detail and, and require a great technical involvement and understanding of what's going on, but they span years. Um, and those of us that um, try and you know cobble together enough money to be able to participate in these sort of projects is how do you keep up and stay involved? Um, for the time that it takes. And in my example of Project Energy Connect, the work I did on that was a couple of years ago. And today I'm finding out that the cost estimate is 70% higher than what it was and that I'll probably have to revisit the cost benefit analysis. How do you stay involved? I think it's a real challenge. Um, even though I get lots of emails, I can get you know invites to come along to meetings and forums and webinars and so on. Also, I need a job that pays a, pays a wage and um, they're just um, not compatible. Just, just on that point too, if I may, Andrew, um, I think uh, my recollection is that there's been some $56 million allocated to um, developing the business case for Marinus Link and all of the preliminary work. Um, the work that the TSBC has undertaken with the help of uh, Galena and Savvy uh, was one of the biggest, if not the biggest project that was funded by ECA up until that point, and it was $250,000. and uh, that's a lot of money in itself, but, but compared to the cost of uh, the work that uh, TAS Networks are doing, and I think that that's part of the, uh, the very large 
capability gap that exists between uh, those that are in the uh, in the game, in the market. It, it's part of their role. They're working at it day by day. And I think 56 million versus 250,000, 56 million is what the uh, uh, the TAS networks folk are, are, are being uh, are allocating to uh, uh, getting the uh, the project up. Provided by the Commonwealth. Provided by the Commonwealth, yes. Um, versus the uh, the 250,000 that uh, the ECA have, uh, have uh, been able to uh, provide to enable the TSBC to to do some investigative work. Uh, that's a pretty good example of the cost disparity and, and the, the resource capability disparity, uh, in my view. Miru? As Andrew said, it, it's really about sort of um, making sure that consumer advocates or consumer representatives are, are meaningfully able to actually participate throughout the process. And this is early sort of um, even before it gets to the RIG-T, so right through the ISP and early kind of scoping stage, because often a lot of those decisions of, of what sort of projects, what assumptions are made um, are done at that stage. And then it, it's sometimes too late to revisit it later on at the, the PADR stage, for instance. Um, and I, I really do kind of second Andrew's um, point about sort of the, um, the opportunity um, to versus meaningfully being able to. And I think that there does need to be that broader um, discussion about how uh, consumer advocates or consumer representatives are actually resourced and empowered to meaningfully um, participate throughout the whole process. Um, and there's plenty of different models that allow that, um, such as, you know, the consumer challenge panel um, or the consumer reference groups that the, the AER runs for some of their reviews or revenue determinations, customer councils, other kind of grants and things like that. There are plenty of models available, um, but it's really about making that a priority. Um, and make and putting some reasonable sort of dollars behind it as well to make that happen. Mm -hmm. And the uh, a piece of work that the uh, uh, TSBC undertook was to look at a new consumer uh, engagement framework, a blueprint for how consumers uh, engage in these sort of processes. Uh, that's one. That's the uh, the third paper that uh, has been made available, and that. Uh, directly reflects the views that Miriu and uh, Andrew have just reflected. Um, and we talk about the fact that as part of the RIT-T process, and in fact any regulatory process, including the production of the ISP, for instance, mm -hmm. we believe there's a role, there's a, 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 an urgent requirement for consumers to be engaged at the start of those processes, uh, that, a, that a competent consumer body should be appointed, established, and as has been pointed out, funded to be able to participate in that process and take it right the way through, and that such a body should have a role in signing off on uh, various aspects, including, uh, we believe, uh, the identified need for all of the reasons that have been touched on to date. And uh, so that's part of the framework that we have proposed. And uh, I would acknowledge the work that the ECA did in coming up with its new reg process, which has been adopted in um, Osnet's uh, most recent uh, revenue proposal, where they had a, a exactly such a consumer body engaged at the start of that process. And I think um, there's people uh, on the line at the moment that were more directly involved in that than I, but I think it's fair to say that uh, there was probably some reluctance for that process, but Osnet stepped into the frame and uh, I think um, they would say that they have benefited enormously from the consumer involvement and the outcomes of their revenue proposal are not what they would have been without the consumer involvement. Uh, and I think that's a, a shining example of, of, of um, uh, how those how consumers should be engaged in these processes and I mentioned the RIPT, so uh, any PADR would be part of the RIPT process would be signed off by that consumer forum uh, and as I mentioned uh, uh, we believe that the uh, the ISP should be subject to the same processes. We're currently under the proposed respond model well you know uh, if you have a look at the uh, responses uh, I think there were 15 responses to the um, PADR um, uh, some, many of those were from consumer bodies, but if you look at the, uh, the depth of the analysis that went into some of that work, you know, some of them were one-page responses from consumer advocates, and I think uh, that's something that has to be changed. Um, and as was mentioned, 
There should be consumer involvement, there should be competent, capable people, uh, and they should be funded. Yep. I, I saw the Consumer Forum, I think they were called, for Ausnet. I saw them in action uh, with Ausnet, and one of the interesting things that I took away from it was that not all panel members were energy experts. And in fact, the fact that they weren't energy experts meant that a lot of the assumed knowledge and assumed um, sort of status quo of things uh, was actually challenged. And it forced the network business themselves to actually go right back to the start and look at how they had built up their own assumptions. And um, there was a lot less left on the table, I would say, as a result of those discussions. And from a Tasmanian point of view, we'd have to say that TAS networks uh, do have uh, a customer panels and uh, revenue reset panels, etc., where consumer groups are invited along. However, you know, we put in strong recommendations and don't necessarily always see uh, the outcome the way we'd like it. And then, of course, that's never going to always be the case, but uh, it just we'd like to do it more often. But the other thing in conjunction with John's suggestion about the uh, our our suggestion about the, uh, the, the consumer group. I think it has to have a strong local focus. It's all very well having a, a gr group set up by the AER or whoever might be to do it, but it's got to have a strong local com component because they're the, the, the consumers who are most directly affected by a decision uh, rather than being a, just a, a nominal consumer group set up elsewhere in the country. Yeah, yeah, it was uh, certainly Osnet's consumer forum were absolutely involved in um, canvassing, you know, real customers and business opinion and doing a lot of the research themselves. Um, so, and that was critical to some of the outcomes. Um, just, sorry, Catherine, just quickly on, on Robert's comment there. I think uh, when we're talking interconnectors, one of the obvious gaps is that, and I think the local representation is absolutely critical, but it needs to be at both ends of the interconnector. I think my experience with Project Energy Connect is, um, it was uh, sort of, it was, most of the cost and benefit, well, some of the benefits appeared in New South Wales, but it was really Electronet talking to their local folks in South Australia, of which I was one. Yeah, really, it needed to be talking to the New South Wales folks. And I think in this case, you'd really want to have a, a group of, um, you know, particularly Victorians, but I guess others in the NEM to see if they agree with the business case that's being put forward, since they'll be the ones that will be asked to be um, uh, the beneficiaries and contributors to it. I actually agree, um, Andrew, and um, we actually deliberately ran our panel forums, Hobart, Melbourne and and, and Sydney, to um, try and capture and encourage encourage uh, input and capture the feedback from, the, I guess, all, all three jurisdictions, because that's, that's absolutely critical. And we absolutely support and encourage uh, involvement uh, of all stakeholders, consumers and others um, in, in the discussions. And just a, just a couple of figures on the Marinus one. Um, four out of the 13 submissions were from consumer groups and eight out of the 13 were from what we would consider vested interests, seven of whom which had significant resources compared to the consumer groups. So again, it comes back to the, the funding question. ECA have a limited budget um, and <laughs> it's our opinion they do a really good job with it. Um, we've, we've been quite successful in being able to advocate on energy projects uh, for a number of years now. But uh, as John said, compared to 56 million provided to TAS Networks to set it up, um, it would have been an interesting, a more interesting situation if the Commonwealth had said, we'll give the TAS Networks $50 million and we'll spread $6 million across consumer groups, both in, uh, in the mainland and Tasmania, to do an equivalent investigation from their points of view. I guess that goes to the whole customer focus of every entity within the NEM, right from the Commonwealth Government down to AEMO, AER and um, AEMC and all the other bodies and how they involve customers uh, in their processes. What do you think needs to be done uh, for the big three, I guess, which is the AER, the AEMC and AEMO? Are there things that they could do in a practical sense that improve the uh, position that we get to when we you know have a proponent like TAS Networks has put up a PADR like this? Andrew, I'm, Miley? I'm happy to venture that, um, I mean I think the AER, they don't always listen and I'm happy to say that, uh, but they have sunk a fair bit of their own budgets into establishing the channel challenge panel, the reference groups, new reg, 
Uh, I put it out there to AEMO, uh, do the same thing. You know, this ISP has been done with lots of opportunities to join into webinars and so on, but no capacity genuinely for consumers to participate. We need to be able to do that. It's totally legitimate. And um, I call on them and I'm sure there'll be someone out there listening. I hope there is. Uh, what are you doing? There you go. Put down the gauntlet. Um, yeah, I think, Catherine, that just, just going back to what I said earlier, our proposed uh, consumer engagement framework, the blueprint, would, would, would see exactly what Andrew was referring to happen. And that is the engagement of consumers uh, at an appropriate level in any regulatory process right from the word go. Okay, ECA, you've got your work cut out for you in advocating for that. And uh, Stephen, we expect you to help. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we'll have some. I'm, I'm taking notes. <laughs> Put your bids in, gentlemen. Um, Mark Byrne makes a kind of comment or a question here, um, back to a sort of more technical issues. Uh, whatever the issues with Marinus, if you're coming up with an alternative, could someone please come up with one that doesn't involve gas fired power stations? You know, his view is that that's an appalling outcome for a climate, from a climate perspective. Stephen? You have a comment? Oh, look, uh, yeah, I mean, Marinus, depending on your view of the future, um, has a big impact of reducing the amount of gas fired generation, A, gets built and B, get, that gets used. Um, so, uh, uh, we, we we let the model choose um, in terms of what's the most cost-effective solution. Um, we do have some scenarios where we put emissions constraints uh, on there, uh, hoping that maybe um, that might become policy one day. Um, but uh, uh, certainly, you know, pumped hydro is a great substitute for gas by generation in terms of uh, lower lower emissions and still providing um, the stability and sickness and, and system support. Uh, that that uh, sickness generation does, um, yeah. So uh, no, we certainly would uh, support that that sort of idea. But when we're doing our economic analysis, we sort of have to be pretty hard, hard nosed and cold and focused on the numbers. Um, my two cents worth would be it's just I, I tend to agree with Mark. But um, like in the, in the Project Energy Connect example, the idea was to displace gas fired generation in South Australia with coal fired generation from New South Wales. And I'm not sure that that's an awesome result either. Yeah, not exactly a, um, reducing climate change emissions or climate. No, but that and I guess, you know, but the idea of yeah, what, what are the alternatives and I guess, you know, more pumped hydro, whether it be via Marinus Link, via heaven forbid, Snowy, or some new local, uh, smaller, more bite-sized projects, maybe combined with uh, a range of, of batteries at uh, chemical batteries at, at various scales, is obviously going to make a huge dent in that. Um, and so I think that that needs to be part of the mix as well. But again, you know, it's we're talking about the transport here, I guess, is of getting whatever that solution may be to where it needs, where it is needed. And uh, and these these the roads the the electrical roads that we are talking about here are really expensive, mm -hmm. and um, I I still I think that there needs to be more of an emphasis on um, the local solutions. We do uh, in all of these projects that I've seen, and I think the ISP included, we are starting from an assumption that I that interconnectors are a vital ingredient, and it's really then working about how do you how do you build the case around that. I'd rather see you start from the um, position that uh, local solutions for local problems are actually the answer and then whatever's left over is where we go to for the inter uh, go to the interconnectors for. Uh, there's a lot of uh, questions on the on the link that talk about um, the benefits and how how much benefits would have to accrue to Tasmania or to Hydro or um, before the, the Marinus link would get up but perhaps we can make the question a bit more broad and look at how the RIT-T looks at um, the beneficiaries or whether it should include a beneficiaries um, principle. How, how, do, how do you allocate costs or benefits in an incredibly integrated, interconnected market? I mean, doesn't that just become too hard? Or is there a way, is there an easy way? Am I missing something? Uh, yeah, look, <laughs> who wants to go first on that one? 
can I venture something that I think it's it's a bit of a philosophical question, and I'd, I'd love to hear from you on this as well, because I know this has been a big focus for PX work in trying to understand how some of this stuff might string together. But for those of us that are, that have been involved in this energy and consumer caper for a while, I guess there's a, I think there is anyway, a view that there is a distinct difference between um, consumers and taxpayers. Um, and we have different roles to play. And what we find though, is that when you ask uh, for these big investments to be funded out of the market, as we call it, um, it's, it's, it's about consumers being asked to pay. Whereas where we see some of those risks um, being mitigated by investments from say, uh, the Commonwealth government in particular, other or, or even state governments, is that um, that risk can then be diversified of us, uh, across us as, um, as taxpayers. And we have a, a much more progressive taxation system. We have contributions from, um, uh, from corporate activity as well as, as us as individual consumers. And I think it's a really important distinction to make. And I agree, there's some really wicked problems here as Muri uh, articulated earlier. And sometimes we do, you have to say, actually the energy market stuff just gets too complicated um, and it's not the answer. Um, but we do have more progressive ways of dealing with it. Yeah, it's really about the how progressive um, the tax system is compared to the sort of energy bill recovery. Um, as we found a lot of households, um, the, the more sort of disposable income and the more, you know, financially um, well off they are, often um, have much lower energy bills than um, households that are, are struggling to, you know, pay their bills on time to um, more sort of disadvantaged as it were simply because they just can't afford those high efficiency um, appliances or buildings. Um, and so I think Andrew hit it on the, the nail on the head there, that there is an important distinction between you know, tax revenue versus um, putting it on bills, because it really goes down to who, when you stop thinking about consumers as, as one amorphous kind of bucket of money to reach into, it really kind of um, a little more nuance on exactly who is paying how much to that is an important distinction to make. And yeah. the point made earlier was that actually are they consumers benefiting or are we assuming, a, does that require us to uh, rely on a perfectly competitive market where there are no monopoly rents? Um, and that gets back to the age old issue that's been around since the NEM was designed is, you know, why aren't generators paying fees? <laughs> <laughs> this, that, Total pricing, it's been around since the, it began. Um, but perhaps there is a question around that, you know, who are the beneficiaries for these types of links uh, for a greater interconnected market? Maybe it should be broader than just end users. Yeah, it must be in, in our analysis, we took, we looked at it from an end user perspective because that's the way the current rules are, are written. Um, and you could look at it from any perspective. I, I guess our perspective is that you need to be consistent if you're going to look at it, um, say the generators should pay for Marinus, then they should be paying for all uh, interconnections, not just one for one uh, in the, just, just to go back to your other comment about the question of beneficiaries and how do you do it? Um, we did some, so I guess in our pattern, we put some modeling there, some theoretical modeling. I think the reality though, it is quite difficult uh, to identify the beneficiaries and then I guess how that change over time. I think the key for our perspective is to make sure that we don't, we want to move away from, and I think as it's going, and the report says the current methodology has got no relationship to beneficiaries when it comes to interconnectors. We don't. We want to make sure we don't let the you know, perfect get in the way of good. I think any step towards uh, a beneficiary pay should be applauded, uh, and and will be a step in the right direction. Um, noting that probably in that perspective, the, the perfection in terms of being perfectly allocated to beneficiaries is probably not attainable, uh, in our view. Very good. Okay. The other, the other thing, uh, Catherine, with the beneficiaries, which was highlighted to me probably yesterday, more again uh, yesterday, was uh, is our climate a beneficiary at some stage, and is that a Commonwealth um, responsibility to support that? Because um, if at the end of the day we're using Tasmania's natural resources to develop this, um, you know, is it is it Australia's uh, role in the world to to provide you know? To, to lower climate emissions, is that uh, is are we then a beneficiary as a nation because of that? Geez, I thought it was complicated when we were just looking at consumers in various regions. I think you've just amped it right up. Um, there's a question here from Simon Moore, and it's an interesting one about technologies, and I'll just read it to you. Um, 
does do go Anna view plausible technology developments as always harmful to the case for Marinus? And are there some technology types or pathways that are more Marinus compatible than others? The presentation seemed to suggest that we don't know what tech will develop, but but we can be sure it'll be bad for Ma the Marinus business case. Um, John or Mark do you, or Carl, do you want to respond to that? Is there a technology pathway that's pro Marinus? You might have to unmute. Carl? Okay. A handball to me. <laughs> um, I, I think most of the, well, technology changes that's what sort of identifying um, different forms. Some of it which would be large scale, some of it would be for, um, distributed generation. So if we're talking about hydrogen and, and the like, um, that's, that, that's obviously a the utility scale. And it, it, in that case, that is, is probably not so compatible. Um, and if we're talking about distributed generation, then that too would not be compatible with that. So I'm struggling to find or think of technology changes that would be to the advantage of Marinus, if you like. I can jump in and help. <laughs> um, I think your slide talked about the, uh, the rise of solar panels and solar power. And uh, I think it's really interesting how our perception around renewables and um, like if we wind the clock back five to 10 years ago, it was all about wind and solar was seen as very expensive and that solar now has come in. Um, the cheaper solar becomes, it actually helps the case for things like pumps, pumps uh, storage because uh, solar needs deeper storage. Uh, and so the, the more that shift between wind and solar, um, the more value there is actually in that deeper, longer term, you know, 12 hour storage um, basis. So. Uh, we are seeing a technology shift that actually is, is supporting the economics of pumped hydro in particular and deep storage pumped hydro. Um, whereas wind um, tends to work better with shorter um, time frame storage because of its, its, its less you know, shorter cycles of up and down. So uh, yeah, there are cases I think that you can see where um, technology has shifted that supports and improves the economics of Marinus. Um. Catherine, perhaps if I could make one observation, and that is that the um, probably at, at starting at a very high level, uh, the work that AEMO does, um, I would suggest, is largely cost-based, which is trying to drive at what's what's the lowest cost methodology that we can use to um, deliver uh, outcomes, which is fundamentally about controlling the flow of electrons between locations. So generating in one place, using it in another place. What's the cheapest way to generate it? What's the cheapest way to transport it between A and B? Uh, and let's look at uh, cost-based modelling. Um, I, I would assert that that's the, the, the underlying mechanism that AEMO uses. Um, the reality of what actually happens in the marketplace when you've got people making decisions as, as a presentation about, uh, what's that word, Alexis? Some of, some, of those, some of us these days use those sort of things. Artificial intelligence, uh, the role that it, it plays currently and the, uh, the role that it will play in future. Um, the behaviour of, uh, of um, um, players in the marketplace where, we, you know, talking about bidding into, into particular you know, bid stacks, you know, what, what's the behaviour of, of uh, investors in, in the companies that they invest in and, and where they choose to put their money? There's a, there's a huge difference between a cost base analysis and looking at what the market is actually doing. And I think when it comes to questions of things like, well, what's the combination of technology? Well, we, we can theorise about what that might be, but really you need to just go into the marketplace and see where the money's being spent. And I have to confess that one of the things I don't see is very many projects which are based on wind, solar and pumped hydro. What I'm, what I'm seeing plenty of is wind, solar and battery hybrids. And I think that's one of the instances where you actually need to go into the marketplace and see what's happening. And um, uh, the slides that, that Carl took us through refer to the decisions that have been taken by people like Origin, like AGL, about where they're actually putting their money. And that 
should be the guide to where we think the, the, uh, the marketplace might go and where technology might head. At least I think that's certainly the, the best guide uh, rather than theorising about where, where uh, you know, how certain technologies might actually uh, combine. Have a look at what the market's doing. But uh, John, is one of the reasons that that is happening uh, because uh, most of the large hydro assets are actually government owned um, and so it's hard to have a huge hydro presence unless you own lots of suitable land. Um, and the pumped, pumped hydro presumably needs a hydro to start with. Uh, you know, is it that just that governments are present in that space and the market, other members of the market just aren't? Uh, look, I, I don't think that's the case, Catherine. I think, um, and Carl, I can see Carl uh, itching to, to provide a response there. So I might just hand over to Carl on that one. Okay. Good idea. Yeah. There's no doubt that pump storage projects take a long time um, to build out. That, that's for sure. Um, and it's true that the opportunity for them is less. But if you look at even Shoalhaven, which is an existing pump storage, which is owned by Origin, rather than developing that out, they've walked away from it and they're going for batteries as a substitute. So you've got to say, why is that so? And and once again, I think this benefit, in some ways, like the modelling sounds like, oh, if the model tells us we get this, that's the answer. Well, I guess we're questioning <laughs> how you set up that model, how it's using these assets. And I don't hear any noises about, from a consumer point of view, if I've got control behind the meter, where does the modelling, the gross modelling, recognise the value that a consumer expects by avoiding network change? I don't hear any noises around that. And that's a significant possibility that no front of meter can actually extract. And yet from a consumer's point of view, who are footing the bills, um, I, I don't hear that being measured or tracked or reported. Well, it's measured in terms of uh, distribution networks requirements for additional um, you know, um, capacity on their networks. It's certainly being modelled in terms of how much solar is costing um, to have on the grid. Uh, what we don't see is the equivalent costs avoided from a distributed battery uh, system because there isn't one yet. And no, I that's think... right. But if we had small batteries, the, the problem with the networks would be one would be one means to mitigate that, mm. and it'd be one means to mitigate the like, like Stephen talks about the long term. We have a long term problem. We all agree. The question is how we find the best. Mm. And it just seems to me that the dimensions of the measurement of what a success is narrow. It doesn't it doesn't fully factor in the consumer benefit of of doing something behind the meter, and all these. We've got a price signal that's at play now. We've got new retailers which are doing cool pass-through. So I've just switched my house over to a cool pass-through retail agreement. And I'm responding to that price signal in the way I can use my discretionary consumption. And one day I'll have a black box sitting in the corner that does all this for me and I don't have to look at it. And the of this technology is very real. That's when I'll get that solution, when I don't have to tell the black box what to do. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly right. It, it will become affordable and it'll become just a normal part of business in the same way you have a router and a, 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 an access point in our home to connect to the internet. We don't have to do anything, it's there. And artificial intelligence will bring that technology there. There's plenty of people spending big money on home management and control systems and they're getting smarter and smarter and they will. And, but we don't see the benefits of that being factored in in any of the assessments. I don't hear any of that coming through. And it's a big fallacy or it's a big fault on the so-called economic analysis. And it, is that simply because uh, just not enough customer focus or not enough customers involved pointed out? Yeah, I think it's, a, it's the voice. The consumer voice is not being heard big enough and loud enough. And if we come back to our first premise, it, the consumers that are paying for these regulated assets, so surely they should have a better say. And if there's a consumer solution that delivers them more direct benefits and indeed at lower cost, why isn't that factored into these modelled solutions? Why is it ignored? Yeah. Um, 
I just like to jump in a couple of a couple of points. Um, the ISP, uh, the one that's just come out, uh, the final one, actually has scenarios with very significant levels of battery of batteries um, being built out uh, in their high DER scenario, um, huge amounts. And, and they've also got a, um, a really good um, discussion around, if you want to actually know, page number 51, uh, on the use of batteries and the fact that uh, initially uh, in their modelling, they see that the one to two hour storage works really well. Um, but then as you get more and more coal retirement, that the system needs more of the medium to long term, the more of this four to 12 hour storage. Um, so they've done some modeling around how that's, what's the, I guess, what's driving the current trend uh, and how they see that going to move into the change into the future. But uh, uh, I guess a key takeaway from Mr. the Mariners plug in here is that under the high DR, under the high battery um, scenario that AMO model, they still see a need and, and value for Marinus uh, in the market. Maybe I've been, I've been reading big on technology, but my, my bet is it's not until we have serious recovery. So I'm still puzzled. We're sitting here in 2020, and, and there's a lot of push to get this thing built by 2027, 20, 28. And I say to myself, we don't face the problem for probably another decade after that. So why are we rushing to build this out today? And even your own modeling showed the big benefits allegedly don't come to 2035. I'm, I'm puzzled as to why we feel compelled in 2020 to commit to this project to solve a problem that starts really in the mid-2030s. Ah, I'm going to have to answer that one. <laughs> and, um, look, I think the answer actually, the simple answer to that one is that we are trying to do risk management here. Uh, we've got a range of scenarios that AMO's modelled and we've modelled. And under some of those scenarios, you need absolutely, you need Marinus in 2028 or earlier. In fact, you, you need Marinus as soon as you can do it under those scenarios where you have coal fire generation closing earlier than their announced um, closure timeframes. And uh, we've heard from the ESB saying that they see that a number of the coal fire power stations are on a knife edge in terms of their economics at the moment. So it's quite conceivable that coal will close earlier. And if it does, Marinus needs to be ready uh, or and other solutions need to be ready to be to um, step into the gap. So that's that's the risk management aspect uh, that AMO is trying to manage and, and I guess we identify as well, is that there are scenarios where um, you, know, you need Marinus um, as early as it can be in 2028 is where we, we place that. Uh, there are other scenarios where it's a bit later, um, um, but we see that uh, you, start, you, know, you start going that costs, so the benefits being greater than costs from about um, 31 in some of, the, some of the other scenarios. So that's why AMO is given a range there. And yes, the, the the real, but the value really kicks up later. Um, from I agree, from 2035 onwards, it really starts kicking up as an, as an M starts getting desperate for for dispatchable capacity. But we're seeing that you, you know, you've, you've still got a positive NPV, a positive case at those earlier time frames. Okay, final question that I have. Um, I think it leads on nicely. We're talking about um, risk mitigation and therefore the least regrets investment. Um, do you think that this principle biases in favour of traditional network solutions? Andrew. Yes. <laughs> Miru. <laughs> Miru, do you have a view? Uh, not a, not as a definitive as Andrew, but um, I'm inclined to think that it probably does. Carl? I, th I think we have a systematic problem with the modelling, which leads to this perception around one is the least regret scenario. I think that's the source of the problem. And I'd be curious to see, I agree with you, Stephen, that there, there's probably lots of small battery technology tunes. My question will always go to, how is it being deployed? How is it being assumed? The evidence in the market is our peaks are getting shorter and sharper. It's ideal for storage. And then the next problem we face is energy overnight. And that is true. Once the solar goes to bed, we'll need more energy. But that energy problem is is not something I don't see. That would, it's an urgent problem. It's, I think it's a modelling problem, which has led to this conclusion, it's all biased towards big ticket thumping solutions, which are not flexible, not staged. I think it's a fundamental problem. Mm. Yeah. 
I'll have to. It's 1.29 according to the play school clock. So I think this uh, session was due to finish at about 1.30. So perhaps Jim, I'd like to thank the panel, uh, Stephen, Carl, John, John, Muru, Andrew, for your comments. I think it's been a fantastic discussion, wide ranging and some solutions, but usually an articulation of further problems that need to be dealt with, as is often the case. But thank you, Jim. I'll hand it back to you. Well, thanks, Catherine. And yes, uh, ACS, thanks also to everybody on the panel, um, advocates and, uh, you know, project partners, and um, also to Stephen for being the Christian in the Lions Den and so forth. So thank you very much. And especially to you, Catherine, for a fabulous uh, effort of, uh, you know, keeping it all moving and uh, pulling all the different uh, threads together. So that's wonderful. We really appreciate everyone's time. We will post uh, slides uh, on the website and everybody uh, will be notified once that is done, hopefully the next few days. And we are working on, um, we will just hopefully have some uh, recording of some sections, uh, at least of the uh, the presentation at the start, uh, at post on the website, and again, we'll notify everybody once that's done and available. Um, thanks so many uh, people uh, joined in today. Uh, really great, uh, uh, I think, you know, excellent outcome, particularly for TSBC and Goanna and Savvy, and uh, from our perspective at ECA for the grants program, it's a wonderful, um, that so many stakeholders, you know, so many people want to get involved in this conversation. So, all right, that's it, I think. Everybody enjoy the rest of your day now. Um, whatever you're doing, going to the beach or going to the pub or... No, we're not doing that, are we? We're all staying home inside. All right. Anyway, fantastic. Take care, everyone. Stay well. And um, we'll talk again down the track. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks, for the, thanks for the opportunity. Thank you. It was great.